Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. I'm grateful to be here. <clears throat> My name is Brett Brumhall, and I am the membership clerk in the ward. I also have a few other roles in the ward. I happen to be the ward paparazzi. You'll often see me take pictures of the families for our ward website. I also maintain our official Facebook page as well. I also have a couple of other roles. I happen to be the Relief Society Executive Secretary and the Relief Society Technology <laughs> Specialist. Uh, it's important to note that the bishop did not extend these calls to me, but I was called by my wife. Uh, I grew up in Orem, Utah. I served a mission in Arcadia, California. I attended BYU where I studied mechanical engineering. During my time there is where I met Michelle. We only briefly dated before she went on a mission to Tempe, Arizona. I wrote her the whole time, and as I did, our relationship grew. When she returned, we continued to pursue the relationship and got married. We lived briefly in Springville in American Fork. Two years later, we moved to the Bay Area in California, where Michelle grew up. I continued to pursue my career in manufacturing and later got a job in the semiconductor industry. I also went to Santa Clara University and earned an MBA. After 11 years in California, we moved back to Utah and lived in North Highland. I worked at IM Flash, the large chip manufacturing facility on, on Tippinogas Highway. Our, our kids were old enough that Michelle was able to start teaching elementary school full time. After four years in Highland, I unexpectedly had an opportunity to work for another chip manufacturer in upstate New York. We followed the promptings of the Lord and moved to the Albany area where we finished raising our children and where they all graduated from high school. Two summers ago when our youngest graduated, we had the opportunity to move back to Utah. We stayed in Michelle's mom in Cedar Hills until, we had, until the time was right for us to get a house. Now, if you are a member of the church, you know the unofficial addendum to the purchase or rental contract for the house you are buying or renting is the ward you are legally obligated to go to. We were initially apprehensive about the higher density housing in Ridgeview and not sure what kind of ward we would get. We considered coming in advance to check it out, but decided to roll the dice and go by faith. We moved here in May, just two Sundays before the Ridgeview ward was created. But as we have gotten to know the ward, we have been amazed at the energy and excitement that there is. And we are not alone when we talk about it. There are many others that have expressed similar sentiments. And even Alex Boyer has said, this is the greatest ward in the world. The more we get to know the ward and the more we have come to love all of you the more, and the community we have created, the more we agree. Michelle and I have lived in a lot of wards across the country over many years. There have been a lot of good things we've experienced, but here we really feel like we belong. But what makes this ward so amazing? How can this be a Zion ward? I'd like to share a few thoughts on why we have an incredible ward and what we can do to keep the momentum going. First of all, who are we? What is our collective identity? What unites us? As the membership clerk, I have some interesting insights. And what I can say is that we are definitely not the typical ward in Happy Valley, Utah. Having grown up here, I found that most wards are quite homogenous, but this is a very unique, diverse ward. So I want to share a few statistics. This week, we crossed the 500 member threshold and now have 508 members in our ward. This is represented by 181 households. 32% of our households, or 59, are single households. 37 households are single women households and 21 are single men. 67 households have no children. 23 are empty nester couples with no children. 22 are young married couples with no children and 22 single households with no children. However, we have the largest primary in the stake. We have 77 primary age children um, interestingly, this year we have 14 seven year olds, so we anticipate a lot of baptisms. And if you think that's a lot, wait till next year because we have 18 six year olds. We have 41 children ages 0 through 2. 
And we have seven babies on the way, at least that's what we know about. <laughs> we have 60 youth, 32 young women, and 28 young men. Well, where are we from? When we move a record into the ward, we can see the ward you came from. The last ward most of us were in was the Highland Second Ward before we split. So that doesn't tell, give me a lot of information, but for those of you who have moved since the ward was split, I can see your prior unit. Well, we have moved here from a lot of places. Four families have moved here from Colorado, three from Arizona, three from California, three from Florida, two from Texas, and one each from Oregon, Arkansas, Brazil, South Carolina, New Jersey, New York, and Missouri. We are literally moving here from all over the country and the world. I can also see the birth country where we've come from. In addition to the United States, nine of us were born in Brazil, three in Mexico, three in Canada, two in South Korea, two in Australia, two in Venezuela, two in England, two in Japan, and one each in Colombia, Germany, UK, Peru, Guatemala, Philippines, China, and Russia. Another interesting statistic is we have 50 converts, which basically means that you are baptized at age nine or older. And we have 285 endowed members of the ward. So we are definitely a ward with tremendous diversity, mixed backgrounds, and varied experiences. But dis despite our differences, there is much that unites us. A common enemy can act as a force for unity, bringing together disparate individuals and binding groups into cohesive force. Whether our common enemy is Satan or the HOA, we are collectively united in our pursuit to improve clarity in our lives, overcome challenges, and defeat the forces that try to pull us down. It is also interesting to think about the reasons and events that led to all of us moving here. Of all the places to move, why is Ridgeview the place? The early pioneers, the driving force in the settlement in the Salt Lake Valley was for a better life. They pursued religious and political freedom. They wanted to establish Zion where they could live in peace and be one. As the first pioneer trek approached the Salt Lake Valley, Brigham Young proclaimed, this is the place. Our reasons for coming to Ridgeview may be different. Some of us have moved here to be closer to schools, to be nearer to family, or to seek proximity to a job. Perhaps a young family has been prompted towards their first home. Conversely, as life slows its pace, some are motivated to downsize where the simplicity of their lives is the priority. Still others have moved here to make a fresh start. Another theme that unites us is the collective challenges and trials that we've had. Every one of us has recently dealt with the disruption, disorder, and chaos that comes from moving. Other trials, such as financial hardship, can tighten its grip, extinguishing dreams and pushing hope to the periphery. Job loss is more than the loss of income. It can feel like losing a limb, severing a vital part of our identity and stability. The fracture of a family can leave deep and lasting scars. In the wake of divorce comes emotional guilt, blame, confusion, and uncertainty. The loss of a loved one can bring profound grief and regret and leaves a gaping hole in the tapestry of life. The trauma of abuse can take root and spread its effects into every corner of life. In the shadow, substance abuse lurks and addictions wield their toll with impacts well beyond the individual. Fortunately, the most important theme that unites us is our faith in Christ. The gospel unites us with Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and with each other. As we are vulnerable and share our trials, we are strengthened. In the book of James, we read, Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. When we live the gospel, receive saving ordinances and keep our covenants, our natures are changed. The Savior's atonement sanctifies us, and we can live in unity, enjoying peace in this life, preparing to dwell with the Father and Son forever. Whether it's standing shoulder to shoulder against darkness, our shared pursuit for progress in brighter days, healing from trials and trauma, 
or being tied together through our common values and faith in Christ, we can create a community of cohesiveness and a brotherhood and sisterhood of saints. We can begin to establish Zion. In the book of Moses, we read the following. And the Lord called his people Zion, because they were of one heart and of one mind, and dwelt in righteousness. There are many examples of the Lord's people living a Zion-like life. As we study the scriptures, we get a glimpse into what it is like to be tightly united and dwell in harmony. In particular, I like how Mormon describes the people of Nephi after Christ visited them in the Americas after his resurrection. And it came to pass that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God which did dwell in the hearts of the people. And there were no envies nor strifes, and surely there could not be a happier people among all the people who had been created by the hand of God. There were no Lamanites nor many any manner of ites, but they were in one, the children of Christ and heirs to the kingdom of God. As we strive to build Zion in our community, we create a sense of belonging and a sense that there is a place for everyone. During our 11 years in New York, Michelle and I had the privilege to get to know a young man named Knut Dennis. At the time, he was 14 years old. He was black and lived in poverty in a town called Schenectady. His mother was a member but was not active. At one point, she spent 90 days in jail for an offense related to drugs. When the missionaries went by, Knut became interested in the church and started to come. As he did, he was befriended by the other youth. As they got to know him and accepted him, um, and they embraced everything about him. As parents saw his testimony grow and his commitment to come increase, they rallied around the effort to get him out. We coordinated rides to church. We scheduled with families to have him over on Sunday afternoons to help make sure he was well fed and that he could experience gospel living. We arranged transportation to Mutual on Tuesday nights. And one particular sister was willing to drive by every day at 5.45 a.m. to pick him up for an early morning seminary. Before his baptism, I had the opportunity to sit down with him to get to know him better. With as different as he was from everyone else, and with as little as he had in common, I wondered what motivated him to keep coming. I asked him why he was drawn to come to church and be a part of us. I will never forget his answer. As he looked at me, he said with a big smile on his face, I feel like I belong. The need to belong is a fundamental human motivation to connect with others and gain acceptance. It's a basic part of our existence to form and maintain relationships with other people. We need to have a ward in which we all feel there is a place for us. If you feel lonely, there is a place for you here. If you are feeling despair, there is a place for you here. If your heart has been broken, there is a place for you here. If your foot has been broken, there is a place for you here. We will welcome you and lift you up. In August 2017, we went on a family vacation to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, as we've always loved hanging out on the beach, catching some waves, and basking in the warm sun. As the time for our vacation approached, we realized that it coincided with a total solar eclipse. And even more amazing was that the path of totality was only one hour south of where we were staying. We have always loved the natural wonders of the world and felt strongly that catching the, the solar eclipse in the path of totality would be absolutely an amazing event of a lifetime. On the day of the eclipse, we packed up all of our beach gear early and started to drive down to a small town called Polly's Island. It was crowded, so we felt fortunate to have found a place to set up. As the afternoon progressed, excitement started to build. We struck up conversations with our neighbors on the beach and got to know them a little bit. I recall one family in particular had come from New Jersey to see the eclipse. Others had come from various locations across the East Coast. Finally, the moment arrived. Gradually, it became darker. Then, at the moment of totality, it became eerily dim, and the shadows disappeared. Everyone was cheering in amazement. We marveled at the celestial event as we looked through the eclipse glasses to see the sun completely dark with a ring of flares around it. We took pictures and videos to capture the moment. 
After just a couple of minutes, totality was over and shadows returned as it got lighter. But even as amazing as it was to see the total solar eclipse, something perhaps more amazing took place. A few people gathered on the beach to cheer and take a group picture. Others saw them and joined in. The group got larger and the cheers got louder. Soon everyone joined. Within a few minutes, approximately 200 strangers had come together from all over what was probably the largest group picture ever taken in the town of Polly's Island. As several of us took a video, one person ran across the sand, leading the crowd in a wave cheer. It was an amazing experience. For a brief moment, complete strangers had come together, witnessed a celestial event, and celebrated our shared experience. It was amazing to feel the, the unity with people we didn't even know. When we become members of the church and the ward, we have certain rights. We have the right to belong. We are entitled to the benefits of being cared for and to be loved. We have the right to be valued and treated as a child of God. We have the right to know our worth. Remember the worth of souls that is great in the sight of God. Now, along with our rights come our obligations as they go hand in hand. When we made our baptismal covenants, we made certain commitments. We are obligated to serve each other. Alba taught us about our baptismal covenants when he said that we are willing to bear one another's burdens that they may be light, yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort. The Lord also admonishes us in the doctrine of covenants to be faithful, stand in the office in which I have appointed unto you, succor the weak, the weak lift up the hands which hang down, and strengthen the feeble knees. As we follow the Savior, keep his commandments, and serve others, we can strengthen each other and establish a Zion Ward. Now, I'd like to offer a warning. What we have established and continue to build may not last. The culture of Christ we are pursuing could evaporate, break down, and crumble. It has happened before. Several years after the Savior visited the Nephites, there was still peace in the land, save it were a small part of the people who had revolted from the church and taken upon them the name of Lamanites. Therefore, there began to be Lamanites again in the land, and there began to be among them those who were lifted up in pride, and they began to be divided into classes. Michelle and I have lived in many wards over our lifetime of church experience. We have seen cliques form. As people begin to get to know each other, other and develop connections, their basic needs are met. They begin to, be, get, to get comfortable in their circle of friends and stop trying to reach out. So when new people move in, they are unintentionally ignored and feel it difficult to break into established social circles. Brothers and sisters, let's strive earnestly to not let that happen. We need to work hard to continue to build a Zion Ward. To keep the momentum going, we need to act. Number one, we need to learn everybody's names. If we are to build a Zion Ward, the first thing we need to do is learn everybody's names. Take time to introduce yourself. Go to the Ward website and browse the families page. We have 79 pictures of families. If you haven't had your picture taken, please see me. And if you don't like your picture, retakes are free. Number two, reach out. Make it a goal to get to know at least one new person or family each week. After you get to know their name, give them a call. Invite them over. Take something over to their house. Bake them cookies. If you don't bake, buy some at Walmart. It doesn't matter, just let them know you're thinking about them. Number three, be willing to minister to those that you are assigned to. Get to know them. Reach out to others that you may not be assigned to. Take time to connect. Listen attentively. Be a friend. And lastly, share. In our Sunday meetings, share your story. Talk about who you are. Be vulnerable. Discuss your troubles. Share your heart. I can attest that the most spiritual Sunday meetings of my life have occurred in this ward. The spirit has been thick. Sometimes we have not had enough Kleenex to wipe away the tears that we've shared together. 
If we heed this call to action, we can do our part to weave together a beautiful fabric of purpose, a sense of order, meaning, and connection in the tapestry of God's masterful plan. In closing, I bear truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that if we truly follow the Savior, we can build a Zion ward. Even with all of our differences, we can build a community where everyone feels a deep sense of belonging and feels we have great worth. As we continue to gather and assemble from all of the world to pursue and witness celestial events in our lives, we will feel a level of unity we have not experienced before. As we serve and love each other, we can establish Zion in Ridgeview, and we will confidently proclaim, this is the place. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.